Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Geometry Colloquium. This is a weekly web series all about geometry processing. This colloquium aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. And every week, we will have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. And today, it's my honor to present two great speakers talking about physical simulation. We have Zai Eris Zhang as our opener to talk about complementary dynamics, and Danny Kaufman as our headliner to discuss their research in reliable responses, simulating elasticity with guarantees. If there are any questions, please leave comments in the YouTube live, live chat. And our opener, Zai Eris Zhang, is a computer science undergraduate student at the University of Toronto, co supervised by Alec Jacobson and David Lavin. And that's right, you have heard me right. She's an undergrad student, but already has a CGRAPH and CHI paper published. She has received Adobe Research Women in Technology Scholarship Awardee and CRA Outstanding Undergraduate Research Award finalist. I had the privilege to work with her and it was so enjoyable. And throughout the project, I had learned a lot from her. It's not enough to compliment her for yet another 10 minutes, but let's save it for her to present her recent work on complementary dynamics. So let's welcome Eris. Okay, thank you, Sonbei. Thank you for the introduction. So I'm gonna share my screen. So does it work? Okay, so today I'm very thrilled to share my latest work. It's named the Complementary Dynamics, which is going to appear at SIGGRAPH Asia 2020. This is truly a collaborative work, which won't be possible without my collaborator, Sanbei Bang, and also my great supervisors, Professor Dave Levin and Professor Alec Jacobson. So let's just get started. So when it comes to realistic character animation, there has been this so-called foundation of animation, or say, principles of animation. Specifically, in this work, we are focusing on identifying the relationship between primary and secondary motion. So what do those mean? If you pay attention to this two simple animation, you will notice that the primary motion is actually clearly defined as this calf jumping motion, while secondary motion means the natural follow through of the calf's wings curves as well as the tail. But now the question really becomes, how do we actually achieve this effectively? People want control over the animation, so they might make it fully animated. This is a good idea since the methods are usually purely geometric and the animator could do whatever they want. However, this is also not that ideal since it requires a fair amount of creativity and also could be labor consuming or hard to achieve complex motion. While on the other hand, people love physical simulation. So they might wish this could be fully simulated. The pros and cons of this approach is obvious too while the physical accuracy could be maintained and sometimes get happy accidents, there is no direct control or artistic intention acted on this animation. Up to here, a paradox seems to appear. The artist's ring displacement can be treated as hard constraints, otherwise physics has no room for secondary effects. Meanwhile, physics can have too much freedom so as to undo the artistic work. Even though there are existing cool papers which attempted to combine simulation and anim animation. We observe that they somewhat put those on a false linear spectrum, which means, for example, Greek space physics constrains the displacement of secondary effects to lie in the subspace spun by the artist's rig. To have interesting secondary effects, it requires augmenting the rig with new auxiliary degrees of freedoms, like in this hash dog, to get motions on those spines, you have to add so many additional rigs, and it can be imagined how many you should even add more for more complex models. Or if you modify the restorship, this is even more like making those two fighting with each other in a sense of minimizing an elastic energy which exerts forces pushing the ship back to its reference configuration away from the artist's pose. Also, this can be catastrophic failure if the rig pose creates a physically impossible or infinite energy configuration. Instead, we advocate that 
Creative primary effects and the physical secondary effects are not contradictory, but rather they are complementary. We are going to show this observation is not just true conceptually, but also algebraically, such that the animation artists can use low dimensional rigs to control the primary motion and rely on our complementary dynamics framework to add interesting elastodynamic secondary effects. So how does our method work? The core idea is this displacement filtering approach, which enables physics to only act orthogonally to the artistic rig, or say the physics lay in the orthogonal complement of the space spent by the rig. The nice thing about this complementary space is that it is highly dimensional and algebraically constructed without many oversets. We quickly point out that this space is only slightly smaller than the full simulation space in terms of degree of freedoms hence is capable of rich high frequency dynamics. The input to our method is a generalized rig function. Agnostic to rig types, we generally treat them as a mapping from some low dimensional control parameters to mesh vertex positions. At the same time, we treat artist's input as a sequence of such rig parameters. And at each frame, given the rig displacement, we are expecting to achieve this energetic final displacement. So the problem really becomes how to find the most satisfying complementary di displacement as a difference. Like most of the simulation papers, we start from the time integration. You are given the potential energy where the psi function could represent any physical model. And you are also given the inertia, inertia term Combining those two, the displacement finding problem for each frame is literally just an optimization problem and which is usually nonlinear. And also in our case, if you do change of variable, instead of finding the final displacement directly, we need to find the complementary displacement first. However, if you blindly solve this unconstrained minimization problem, the physics is just so aggressive such that it will completely undo the rig pose. Instead, we propose that, say the rig spans such a large space. At each frame, we compute the local tangent space and restrict the complementary displacement only leaves in the space orthogonal to that. Mathematically speaking, this requires us to compute the Jacobian of the rig displacement with respect to the rig parameters. If you turn this intuition into math, the constraint looks somewhat scary since there is such an argument thing embedded. However, by enforcing the first order necessary condition of a local minimum, we quickly point out this can be greatly reduced to some linear constraint, which is really nice. So instead of solving an unconstrained problem, we are now solving an unconstrained simulation problem. Restricting the complementary displacement to the orthogonal space while finding the best possible displacement that minimizes this combined total physical energy. And compared to typical simulation, say for each frame, you are given the rig displacement and then you do change of variable and you update the local Jacobian matrix and solving a constraint optimization problem instead and finally recover your final displacement. Such simple. Okay, to demonstrate how effectively this simple additional constraint can work, we test it on a variety of different examples. First of all, we show that our method can work for any rig type. This is a 2D angry bird model rigged with two with three bone handles. And you could say how its feather becomes jiggling. And same for this cage handle example, the walrus model is rigged with harmonic coordinates. And as I mentioned before, our method not only just work for linear rigs, but also for nonlinear rigs, since we're enforcing the constraint in a, in a first order necessary manner. And this dual quaternion scanning example just show how well it works. As a bonus, simple K-frame K animations can be easily enriched with secondary dynamics with the flip of a switch. 
The same is true for rigid body simulations. As secondary effects to post-process of rigid body simulation to look more elastic without needing to rerun collision detection or change the overall scattering of objects. And you could say how precisely this position is preserved. And next, we show by adding such a constraint, we actually doesn't really change the material property and the way it interacts with the environment. Here we show a worm with homogeneous material in the middle and heterogeneous material. Here we show. And also we show how this amoeba reacts with the wind force as a background. And you can say the input is such simple, while the output has a lot of rich dynamics. And same for the collision detection. In this example, we simply use the penetration force-based approach to handle the collision. But I guess Danny will talk more later about more robust modern approaches to handle this. And not only for FEM-based simulation, we show our method also works for the cloud simulation. And, comp and compared with previous methods, as I mentioned, Rig space need extra rigs, while ours get a lot of rich dynamics for the spice. And compared with steel bones type of simulation, ours can work effectively by, act, by interpreting the rig as the motion acting on the shape instead of some geometric uh, positional constraints. And in the end, we also compare with tracking based methods. Previous tracking-based methods need this segmentation, which means to get realistic motion, you need to babysit those segmentation of the original model. And you can say when there is only one clusters, it just completely fails to track the motion. While there are too many clusters, it just almost rigid. And also we download this dinosaur uh, animation created by artists online and show like such rig in the wild, which has 15 numbers of bones, we can, our master can still find room to add secondary effects. So in the end, about the limitation and future work, we have to say, unfortunately, complementary dynamics is not complementary, which means like most of the simulation methods is still far from being real time. So the immediate next step is to try to make complementary dynamics fast. And then we're excited to say it can be integrated in those live performance environments. To conclude, we advocate again that complementary dynamics turn physics simulation into artists' respectful partner rather than an unruly party crusher. And we thank our sponsors and also my co-authors again. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Aries, for this great talk. Uh, due to the limited time, uh, we will proceed the talk to our, our headliner, and we will have a joint Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So um, our headliner, uh, Danny Kaufman, is a senior research scientist at Adobe Research. He has built a very concrete route on physical simulation on computer graphics. In early works, he ex expertised himself with comparing frictional contact between objects. With his experience in physical simulation, he recently expanded his research to cloth simulation, hair simulation, or fabrication design, and even went further for extreme deformation. Where in one of his recent work, he rips off Donald Trump and turns him into a butterfly with smooth topological change. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome Danny Kaufman to present about reliable responses simulating elasticity with, with guarantees. Okay, great, let's see if we can do some sharing here. Okay. Great, can you guys see my screen? Okay, hopefully that's- No, we see your presenter display, I think. Ah, interesting, that didn't happen a minute ago, no? Let's try it again. No. <laughs> All right. And we'll try the other desktop. How about now? Now we got it. Thank you. 
Sweet. Okay, great. Well, first off, I want to thank the organizers for putting this uh, series together. Um, you know, right now with all the relative craziness going on, I think it's all the more important that we all find places and times to come together and uh, learn about what we're all up to. So uh, in particular here, I think this is this is really great. I've been really enjoying this uh, series. So what I wanted uh, to talk me, Danny, about today. One, yeah. One second. Could you please move the Zoom bar, the green and red uh -huh. screen sharing Zoom bar from yeah. the bottom of the screen? Let's see if it allows me to do that. It doesn't seem to be. Hold on. It's fine if it doesn't. Yeah, it'd be great if we could. How about now? Better? That's perfect. Thank you. OK, great. All right, so let's get started. So as I mentioned before, um, you know, we're going to be talking about uh, physics here, right? And so in particular, we're going to be talking about reliable responses for simulating elasticity with guarantees. And that's a mouthful, so we can kind of just reduce the, top, uh, the topic of the uh, talk together a little bit more down to uh, really robust physics, right? So that's really the key thing that we want to talk about now, right? And uh, in particular, what we know is that simulating physics is, is critical in all kinds of applications. And these range from the classic VFX hero shots we're all familiar with to more mechanical engineering analyses where you know, the, we design and safety test things like our cars, our bridges, and honestly, even most of our toothbrushes have been tested at some point or some form or another with a finite element type analyses. And of course, we have robotics where we use simulation to help robots predict their environment and essentially navigate through it. And of course, for gaming, right? This is a classic one. And even more recently, we have new applications like for autonomous driving and for immersive reality where we use physics to tie us into the environment around us right? and find different ways to really become engaged. And so given the ubiquitousness of this of the simulation, perhaps one place to start looking and, and start thinking about is the surprisingly large gap between these really cool simulation outputs and what we can reliably, consistently, and automatically deliver with the codes that we currently have available and that we're creating. And while we certainly can simulate these really awesome, beautiful one-off shots and really interesting interactive rate custom scenes that we've seen and we've all played with, unfortunately, existing solutions still fail regularly in really pretty unacceptable ways as we, we change parameters and move things around. And so one way to get a sense of this is let's consider this very simple test, right? This is a squishy chain, chain test. And all I've done here is the silver chain at the top is a fixed rigid link. And now here I'm dropping some deformable finite element links on it. And this is kind of the output that we're looking to get. And hopefully video is coming through. And so now we can start taking a look. So we can start by looking at SOFA. And SOFA, to my knowledge, is one of the most robust and performant open source soft body uh, solutions that we have in graphics. And if we take a look on the left here, for five links, we get a nice solution, maybe a little bit too oscillatory, but overall really acceptable. But now on the right, if we take exact the same simulation setup, same configs, same everything, just add a few more links, this is the result we get, right? So nothing's really changed, just the geometry. So we can look at the other end of the graphic spectrum. We can try out best in class commercial solutions like Houdini's Planet Element Solver. And here, no matter how soft we make the links, the solution is still failing. Right. So we can try less visible methods like position-based dynamics, or what we call PVD in Houdini's Vellum Solver. And if you're familiar, this one's pretty comparable to NVIDIA's in Inside PhysX. And now, as you see here on the right, we can successfully get more links here. But this comes as a cost in these methods because they become less and less reasonable and less and less physical as the setup becomes harder. For example, here you're seeing these ugly ghosting artifacts and symmetry breakings, where essentially the constraints are fighting against the physics. And you get this non-physical jittering. OK, so those are graphics codes. And, and a reasonable question comes up, what about engineering codes, the ones we use to design the aforementioned bridges and cars and things like that? And presumably and hopefully they're better. And in many cases, they are. But when it comes to soft body contact, in many ways, the situation is actually even worse. And for instance, we can try this much, much simpler example here, where all I'm doing is dropping a simple finite element neo hooking block in green through the uh, slot formed by the gray blocks here. And so now if we go to best commercial fine element codes, including ANSYS, console, Abacus, across the board, they all fail pretty miserably already in this example. For example, here's a pretty representative output in ANSYS, where you're seeing that there's intersection, symmetry breaking, and if you keep on going, there's going to be an explosion as well. And so these kinds of examples, for me at least, bring up a pretty obvious follow-up question. If these simulation tools are so brittle, 
How are all these really cool physics outputs we're so used to seeing in movies, the ones who rely on in engineering, actually being created in practice? And so here the answer is essentially by craft, generally by slow, really careful, hand customized tweaking of parameters per scene, example, an application. And if you used to find out element code, you're probably familiar with some of them. But these in turn really require expert skills. And for example, for VFX, technical directors can spend hours or even days carefully fine tuning and hand tweaking algorithm parameters for a hero shot. And the scene setups are also really important. And so even for experts, this is clearly a really slow process, much less for amateur creators or designers or engineers. And again, while we might hope for something better engineering, we find that these codes also require similar custom hand tweaking of the simulation meshes and the algorithm parameters in very similar ways. And to check on this, we've had lots of very long, long, long conversation threads with customer supports for these engineering tools. And in the end, their suggestions all pretty much boil down, not surprisingly, or perhaps surprisingly, depending on how you look at it, to pretty much the same hacks we're all familiar with under the hood of simulation graphics codes. And they essentially result in comparable output, or in many cases, even worse for the graphics engine. So for instance, what I have here is one of my favorite quotes from support, which essentially tells us, despite the fact that they have a contact feature in their dynamic FEM code, it actually shouldn't be used for impact or collisions, essentially not useful for contact, um, which, is, which is pretty concerning, right? And of course, this observation of the limits of simulation is not really new. For instance, it's been in robotics for a long time. And nor is it really restricted to robotics, engineering, and film. It happens all over the place. So what's going on here? So essentially, what I'm saying is physical simulation technology is deeply in debt. And here, the big issue is the gap between the promise of easy interaction, reproduction, and exaggeration with physics and the scenes that we're all used to seeing in movies and games, and what we can really actually reliably deliver has become way too large. But beyond feeling safer in our cars, which you know, obviously is a reasonable concern, why should we actually care about these limitations? And I think there's many reasons, of course, and I'm sure some of them come to your mind for you as well. But one thing that I think is interesting to think about is if we can reliably simulate physics out of the box, we can enable all sorts of new applications that take advantage of our everyday familiarity with physical interactions and the eases, affordances, beauty, and, and, and all the different things that physics actually offers us. We have a great chance to create new ways to use physics as a creative tool for engineers, artists, and designers. And to get started, let's consider a few examples. And I'll start focusing on a few things that we've been actually doing at Adobe. So one place we use physics simulation is to help artists and designers quickly understand and visualize the effects of die line fold patterns as they create their package designs and visualize the graphics on them. And so really understand the mapping as they go from you know, essentially 2D to 3D. And we've also been integrating physics with 3D transform tools to enable easy 3D manipulation and layout. Uh, this was a demo that we just demoed last week at Adobe Max. But here the key thing is that we want to make manipulation easy and seamless. So we let the user give us the high level manipulations and essentially let physics here give you the low level details, right? So you don't have to do the fine tuning and adjustment to enforce a non-intersection and to get easy natural layouts. So for instance, we can make that uh, picture look all right there as well. We're also already using physics as an artistic tool and character editor. We've been doing this for a while now. And here we can live rig characters like Hector that you see here and then deform and perform him to quickly create controllable animations. We can live perform change material stiffnesses to essentially live play and live rig to get different effects or even change those material parameters inside an animation to live perform deformation dynamics. And again, here, of course, if they were gonna expose this to a user, we can't really put guardrails on what they can and can't do. They can really expose the parameters and play with them in, in any way they might want. And similarly in production, animators are using Character Animator and Showtime program our cartoon present where we're using physics parameters as artistic tools rather than in any way at all to match reality. So for example, here they turn gravity upside down for this character to get the springy hair behavior that they wanted. And you know, they can change this and again, live perform and see what they're going to get. So I guess worth mentioning a quick brag that you know, for our work on this show and also in The Simpsons, Character Animator just received the Technical Emmy last week. So um, you know, using physics for this kind of nice performative way that we just saw earlier in the last talk is really exciting. I think there's lots of cool things we can start doing here. And this is just really kind of touching the surface. And of course, there's physically based paint simulation, for instance, in Fresco. 
And here the idea is essentially the physical flow and mixing of paints that's so natural and beautiful can be nicely combined with the precision and edibility of digital tools. So very similar to the kind of physics-based manipulation down what I showed you earlier, we want to get, essentially combine these nice affordances of physics with digital precision and get the best of both worlds. And of course, we're seeing that physics can provide rich and inexpensive data for machine learning applications as well. And so here we can use it to learn about the real world and also for ways for us to augment that world. And here I've just thrown up one bias representative example of this work. There is obviously a huge ton out there. But in any way that we're going to do this, this requires accuracy and reliability across parameter variations, right? And ideally, of course, differentiability as well for, for obvious reasons for neural training. And current differentiable models of contact are really pretty much neither. So this, this you know, opens up a whole nother question. As we do parameter change, we should always be getting reliable simulation. And so similarly for design optimization, just like machine learning, simulation sample needs to be both accurate and robust across all the parameters we want to explore and ideally as efficient as possible. But we need to get predictive simulation and we need to not get garbage out as I change a simple parameter, a simple geometric setting. Okay, so here already in all these examples, what we're seeing for physics is physics for design and art making, as well as for engineering and animation and robotics. And even looking well beyond these current applications, we clearly have great opportunities to come up with new ways to apply physics as a tool for artists, engineers, designers, for amateurs. Um, but you know, the question again, just to kind of hammer it home is what's needed to make it happen? Well, to make these and future applications possible, physics needs to work all the time for all kinds of input. We can't predict what a user will want to do, and we can't restrict what parameters they may need because that just basically makes the tool unusable, right? And so this brings us right back to the question of reliability. And as we've seen, this is where simulations have been falling down, too much brittleness. So I've been looking at this problem off and on for a really long time now myself, but a few years back, the problem was really brought home to me in the design project I was working on with Dave Levin at University of Toronto and some of our collaborators at MIT. And so here what we're doing is we're performing design optimization for dynamic functionality. As an example you see on the bottom are some 3D printed jumper toys that we wanted to do tricks like these, flip over an obstacle and land on the other side a couple times and so forth. And the key thing here is key to making this work is tons and tons of predictive simulation. And if design variations can't be simulated, if we get garbage at some point, the whole process obviously breaks down. So a key insight that we're able to take advantage of in this project was a new spectral preconditioning method that we developed. And the nice thing it did is it enabled us to really lower the size of our spatial discretization and really helped us push forward in terms of being able to do efficient. And so sim uh, simulation actually worked in this design process. But we still really remain time step limited, especially as the contacts and the nonlinearity increase in the project. So after the jumper project, we started looking at design combinations of softer and harder components. These are not super soft, but already they're starting to become challenging. And as we got more and more significant deformations, what we're starting to see is this is kind of essentially killing pretty much every simulation method we could get our hands on. And you saw some of the kinds of results we were seeing earlier in some of those demonstrations I showed you in the beginning. And since then, over the last couple of years as a field, and, and you've been seeing some talks about this, we'll see some more in this series, we've been making really rapid progress on better ways to solve deformation. But as we've just seen, when we add contact response into the mix with elasticity, things can go bad really, really quickly. And yet almost every single interesting effect and pretty much honestly, every fun thing we can do with solid mechanics generally is going to involve contact. It's pretty much unavoidable. Take a look at the desk around you, take a look at the way you interact. Contact is everywhere. Contact is happening all the time. It's not some subsidiary effect. We need to handle it, we need to resolve it. And we need to do it coupled in a good way with elasticity. All right, so as I've mentioned, I've been focusing on this problem for a while now. And to address these needs, we've been developing a new model and algorithm <clears throat> that we're calling IPC. And so the main thing here to think about is IPC gives guaranteed high quality simulation output for elastic solids like you're seeing here. And when you need it, it can also give you high accuracy. So for example, here's IPC on those unit tests that I showed you in the beginning. So on the far left, what you're seeing is IPC giving the nice consistent results you would expect from a chain. Well, in the middle, you're seeing the ghost forcing and the artifacts that I mentioned that we're getting from methods like PBD. 
Similarly, on the right-hand side, we're seeing that engineering unit test that I mentioned here. And when we want accuracy, here's an example of it. I can see it's resolving context, even here, where we're making the slot gap just a couple of microns wide. So that's great. These are nice unit tests, right? And they're essentially predicates to really understanding whether we can use a simulation method reliably. But then I guess the question really starts to become for bigger simulations, where we start to look at interesting complex deformation, dynamics, context, collisions, for example, the squishy boy, ball toy, you know, what's gonna happen with all these tendrils, for instance? So this is a kind of a nice stress test for us to start thinking about that. So to do so, we can equip that model with a, a high-res mesh. And here we're doing well, well over 2 million tetrahedra. And then we can, for instance, fire it off here at this glass wall. And we'll pause the simulation here to kind of highlight a couple of key guarantees that we want to have and that we offer with IPC. And so the first thing that we can say is that IPC ensures that the mesh remains intersection and inversion free. And this is critical because both intersections and inversions are the major sources of failures, for instance, in some of the examples that we saw earlier. So we can maintain this guarantee not only at this moment of maximum compression, but all the way out throughout the simulation, we're capturing this nice high frequency motion, these oscillations, and at the same time, still ensuring that all of the geometry, all the tendrils are staying intersection free throughout. Okay, so another nice feature of IPC is that we can torture it with extreme boundary conditions while it's free to pretty much take as large a time step as we want. So here we're simulating this long-term twisting of the cloth mat and we're doing it with frame rate size time steps. So, so no sub-stepping at all. We'll get into the question of you know, sub-stepping a little bit in just a minute. This is hundred simulated seconds. We're doing about four X playback. And so another important thing that IPC gives us is along with guaranteed feasibility and stability, IPC also handles contact between both volumetric and pretty much all co-dimensional objects. In fact, all co-dimensional objects, there's no, no qualification there. And so as far as I know, this is pretty much impossible in existing codes that are available. From a practical point of view, what does this mean? Importantly, it means we don't get snagging and there's really no need for the usual mesh cleanup that we usually need to do before plugging a mesh into a simulator. So it also allows for examples like these where we can torture soft body collisions with co-dimensional triangles on the left where the mat's hitting them or it's even the line segments like you're seeing stably on the right for that squishy ball. Right, so here's another example to kind of highlight it. Here we're dropping a finite element ball through some frictional contact with rollers that are kinematically scripted. And I can take that same example and remove the faces and just collide with only the edges. Or I can even just go a little further, remove the edges and only collide the ball with just the uh, points here, just the vertices. Okay, so that's a whirlwind tour of a bit of what IPC can do. So now let's dive a little bit deeper into the formulation, the details of seeing how it actually works. So first, just get everyone on the same page. Let's recall a little bit about how elastodynamic works. Fortunately, Erson just gave, it, Erson just gave us a little bit of a intro into that. And generally what we do is we do this by time step. And this is essentially just chunking time up into bite-sized pieces. Now what we do is we advance the simulated material forward bit by bit in each such step, right? And then sequence together, this gives us a full simulation. For instance, this armadillo catapult that we're seeing here. But now generally we wanna pick a time step size based on the application that we have in mind. For example, for animation, we might wanna pick a frame rate and for computational physics, we might wanna pick a much smaller time step to capture high frequency details. But irrespective of the time step we're targeting, most methods then require much smaller time steps or essentially sub steps to stay stable and artifact free. But in turn, if you think about it, this can get really expensive since each sub step is really an expensive solve. And instead, essentially what we wanna do is take the full step directly. And this is where Newton type methods are really helpful. But when we add contact into the picture, things become much, 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 much harder. And now as we saw earlier, even taking tiny time steps won't necessarily guarantee success and stability, for examples, where contact is really stressing the deformation. So generally, this is because of problems like intersections, like the ones we're seeing here on the left, and numerical explosions, like we're seeing here on the right, they're gonna occur as collisions and deformations interact. So to address some of these issues, methods apply custom heuristics and band-aids, and I'll probably have time to mention a few of these later, 
But as we saw, this really makes codes brittle. And, and all it really takes is to a small change in the problem setup, for example, the geometry, the material, even the time step. And then essentially these problems make a simulation go from something good to something essentially unusable. So if we take a little bit of a view here, you know, one key thing that makes this collision processing with elasticity crazy is figuring out which constraints are active, or in other words, which constraints need to push, and then enforcing them accurately. And this is expensive to do because real contact constraints are challenging. And it's not enough to just make sure you're feasible. To make sure it looks good, you have to balance the contact forces with the rest of the entire system and, and the rest of the physical forces. And here the constraints really need to be precise and globally valid. So let's make this a little more concrete. And this will look a little bit familiar from the last talk uh, because we had a nice intro of this already. But essentially, what are we doing? At each time, te time step t, we can build the energy from the sum of an elasticity potential together with an inertial term, right? So this should look very familiar. We just saw this a moment before. And so here, the elasticity potential is both non-convex, right, and non-linear, right? And so this is just one example of such an incremental potential, right? We can have many different of these incremental potentials for different time steppers other than implicit Euler. We can do implicit Newmark and so forth, but they all essentially have the same form. And the key thing to notice here is that the nonlinear, non-convex deformation energy here is scaling with time step. And so solving the problem becomes all the more challenging as we try and take larger and larger step sizes. So to solve this problem without contact, we and other folks have been developing custom Newton methods. And key to making them work is two things. We need line search for globalization because we may not be very close to our solutions and we need higher order information. So contact then adds extra inequality constraints to the system that we need to satisfy under minimization to prevent the materials from intersecting. And doing this really poses two key challenges that we have to address. So first, while it's you know, nice to abstractly wish and hope for some nice constraint functions G, it, it generally turns out to be really challenging to define these constraints in a globally consistent and precise way that works for discrete surfaces. The second key thing here is that no matter how good our constraint functions actually are, they're going to add lots more nonlinearity and non-convexity to our problem. So the other big challenge here is how do we design reliable solvers for the resulting inequality constraint optimization problem? So to address these challenges, let's start by looking a little more at this innocuous G function and, and understand this a little bit better. And so when I was first introduced to contact mechanics early on in my PhD, this was always a really big cause of confusion for me as I was reading the literature. And generally the flow of almost all contact mechanics papers is generally something like this. And an abstract notion of an admissibility set is introduced and it's usually with a kidney shaped admissible set like this on the left. And, and, and these pretty much always remind me of swimming pools. So I don't really quite know what to do with those. And secondly, it's effectively equated to some magical constraint function G, who somehow its non-negativity is expected to maintain this invariant of admissibility. And this is all well and good for toy examples that come equipped with a nice analytic G. But how do we create such a function that ensures non-intersection for a real world 3D solid like this one? Or better yet, for discretization, for example, a triangulation like this of it. So, so in practice, what's pretty much always done here is a hat trick, right? At some point, computation actually needs to happen. And so this abstract notion of G has to be swapped out and is swapped out for concrete measure. And here's where we generally run into trouble pretty quickly. So next, let's take a little closer look at how these constraint measures have actually been cooked up and applied. So currently, while details can vary a bit, we can pretty safely bin the constraint functions used into one of two standard approaches. So first off, we have volume constraints. <clears throat> and so what do these volume constraints do? They define closest pairs, think you know, triangle and point edges in our case on the surfaces. Here, of course, I'm illustrating in 2D. And then what they do is they define contact constraints as just the sign volume of the tetrahedra that they form. And here the constraint is that they should be not negative, right? So alternately, we have gap constraints. And these are pretty much generally the de facto default in mechanics and also super popular in graphics. And so these are also defined between close point triangle and edge edge pairs. And here again, the gap functions find closest points on each pair of these surface primitives and then define contact constraints assign distances of these closest points along the normal direction. So again, these should be non-negative. 
And generally, almost all work exclusively focuses on the errors introduced by approximating these nonlinear constraints. But a key thing to think about is even on their own pre-approximation, these constraint definitions can be pretty bad. And so the first thing to notice is they're not globally valid. And in fact, they're really only okay in very small regions of support. And to see this, let's notice that if the displacements are not kept tiny, the relative position of the surface primitives can change really rapidly like here. And in turn, this makes constraint definitions increasingly inaccurate and quite often even wrong altogether as we're seeing here, right? So in turn, if we try and solve physics with them, this produces incorrect, over-constrained or sometimes even entirely infeasible constraint sets. And we have a pretty thorough analysis in our paper if you're curious to see how this plays out across a wide range of methods. I won't have time to go into that analysis here today. But, but even so at a very high level, what this highlights is that the standard constraint models themselves, even before subsequent approximation, whatever it is that we're gonna do with them, are only locally valid proxies for admissibility. So to address these issues, we're gonna start from the basics again and build up a new and simple model for contact mechanics. But before we do that, let's next take a look at some of the existing solution methods as well. Some of the issues they run into is that we can build both our model, keeping in mind practical concerns of how we're actually gonna solve it. So what about time step solvers? Well, obviously currently solution methods apply a large variations, but, but essentially they're broadly speaking, applying the same general iterative strategy. And, here I'll briefly focus on some of the common and important themes that we should keep in mind. So at a very high level, at each iterate, this uh, incremental potential energy, the energy for the time stepper is generally approximated roughly up to uh, second order. While the constraints in turn are linearized, right? Then we have a con resulting constraint subproblem using these approximations, which is solved to get our next iterate. And then the process is repeated, rinse and wash, right? And so while the details vary quite a lot, for example, many methods solve just a single iteration, while other methods decompose per constraint early on before linearization, most effort has been on finding new and better ways to solve these iterates. But remember, the constraint functions themselves are already poorly defined. Adding linearization on top of them is only gonna make them worse. And while we're using higher order information for deformation, we really only have first order information here on the contact forces even though they're at least as strongly nonlinear as the deformation energies that we're working with and a good deal sharper. So then to compound the damage, there's really no good way to perform line search in these methods. And in fact, for this reason, most methods skip line search altogether. But this often produces large instabilities and explosions as you might expect when dealing with deformation and nonlinearity. So to address these problems, methods then apply small time steps, right? We mentioned this earlier and a wide range of band-aids. And uh, I won't have time to go into all of them, but for example, most methods use constraint offsets or thickening, right? To help reduce intersection problems by pushing the constraints off a little bit. But these fixes in turn can just as easily destabilize problems by making them infeasible. So now the challenges outlined, let's take a look at them again. I'm gonna start in on developing IPC and we'll begin by addressing our first challenge here. How can we define a globally valid and precise non-intersection constraint on meshes, right? So based on what we just saw, a large issue with the existing methods is that the constraints currently used and also the linearization that we just talked about are not globally valid and are also imprecise. So let's start thinking about that first. And we'll start from scratch again, and we'll begin again with time continuous, but spatially discrete settings. So with tetrahedral meshes. And we can start with a very simple but important observation. If we define local constraints via precise distances defined between all non-adjacent and non-incident surface primitive pairings, so for instance, in this case, vertices, edges, and faces, as our constraints, we can get a globally consistent constraint set irrespective of how large the displacements become. So concretely, maintaining a local condition here, right, of positive distance between all these pairs is going to ensure a global condition that maintains a non-intersecting path if we can do this for all time. We can get, make this a little better yet by focusing in on even a tighter subset of these pairs. Specifically, if we can maintain this intersection-free state for all times, then all we need to look at are just distances between non-incident point triangle pairs like the one you see here, and also between non-adjacent edge-edge pairs on the surface mesh. 
And the reason this is, this is because all of our pairwise distances are lower bounded by these measures. Okay, so now we've kind of almost come full circle. So now we're only looking at point triangle and edge edge pairs on our mesh. And this essentially somewhat validates the standard practices we're familiar in graphics. Our collision stencils here are now going to be the same as in traditional simulation. But here the key difference now is that we're defining our constraints on them with exact unsigned distances. And so what are these distance functions? Well, the precise distance between each point triangle pair and similarly for each edge edge pair can be defined as I'm showing here with just a small constrained optimization problem. And so although these are a little dense, the thing to notice here is both of these minimizations are simple. They're not doing anything fancy. They're just giving us distances between closest points. But of course, the key thing to notice is the closest points are going to change specifically their formulas with relative position. So concretely notice the inequalities here. So for different relative positions, we have different active sets. And for each of these, we're gonna have a different analytic solution, meaning that we can define piecewise distances, uh, precise distances, sorry, as piecewise smooth functions, right? So think about it this way. For example, in 2D, right? So this little didactic example on the lower left here, we can compute point edge distances with two different expressions depending on the relative position. If it's a point like this one here in the orthogonal span of the edge, then we're just gonna use a point line formula, right? Well, if the point is outside the span, we can use a second expression, which is just our point point formula, right? And we can have a C1 transition between the two of them. We'll get into that a little bit more later in a moment because that's key. But now there's an interesting issue that already comes up. As I mentioned earlier, these distances are unsigned, not signed. And so if left as inequalities, they're pretty much useless because if you think about it, the inequality is always going to hold, right? Fortunately here, the solution is simple, at least in theory, although challenging in practice, which is we can just make our inequalities strict. Okay, so now with this work here, our model is pretty close to being done. We apply dynamic subject to continuously preserving positive unsigned distances for all time for all of our surface pairs that we look at. And if we do this, we're guaranteed an intersection free path. So you know, stated like that, I think it's easy enough, but, but the question of course is now, how do we actually do this in practice with computation? So the next step here is to jump into discretization again, right? And so here displacement for each of our time steps is linear. So this gives us a piecewise linear trajectory. While we still need our constraint guarantee to continuously be enforced in time, this means we can now enforce our condition independently per linear segment, and so per time step solve separately. So next thing to remember is we need to solve an implicit time step problem, not an explicit one. What does this mean? It means each step is gonna be solved iteratively. And this means that it's not enough just to constrain the trajectory per time step. We're gonna to have to do a slightly odd thing we're actually gonna to have to dive inside the solver. So essentially, you know, one way to think of this is that the optimization itself, yeah, just abstractly, is just a machine for exploring trajectory variations. And of course, from the optimization point of view, this is just really the variational perspective, right? So if we think about it, this means we have to make sure that every iterate variation that we explore in any way in the optimization is gonna be correctly constrained. And so before we even build any such solver, let's abstractly spec out what we need. So the first thing we need is we need an, an intersection free initial starting point, initial state, right? If we have that, then we just need a convergence solver so we can satisfy our discrete equations of motion, the incremental potential that I showed earlier and that we also saw in the last talk. And finally, we need to ensure that the IPC constraint condition that I mentioned earlier is satisfied over every single iterate. So let's make that a little bit more sharp Specifically, what we now need is for every time step t along every linear updated position i, we're going to guarantee that all of our pairs k always maintain a positive distance. The nice thing is, if we can do this, then the entire simulated motion will always be strictly intersection free. And because our model is built on unsigned distances, it works equally well for co-dimensional collisions like the ones you see here on the right, ones I showed you earlier while the constraints themselves are not proxies and they're instead going to be globally valid everywhere. Okay, so now we've built our constraint model. Let's see how we can use it to address our second challenge, 
and build it into a reliable time step and algorithm. Okay, so without yet defining details, we know that at every iterate, we're going to explore a linear displacement. Let's call that guy P. And since it's linear, we can enforce the constraint here by applying standard CCD, standard continuous collision detection, to find a large step size that's non-intersecting for all surface primitives, right? And so this is standard code that we have available, nothing new. But then we simply require each iteration step to be smaller than this bound. What this happens is doing this ensures that we are intersection free for every possible update of position and so for the whole simulation, right? And that's key. And so now we essentially have a fully spec model and requirements for optimization, but this leaves us with one thorny question, which is how do we actually solve this optimization? So remember the constrained linearizations that we looked at earlier generated ill-posed, infeasible, and essentially unstable solves. And at the same time, they really can support line search for us, which is really critical for globalization. So let's see if we can start addressing some of the issues. And at the same time, the other thing to think about is they only gave us first order information for our constraint functions, even those functions were really strongly nonlinear. We want more information. We want to use Newton type, to, uh, type stepping for it. And so for IPC, we instead want to directly evaluate our constraint functions. We want to perform line search. And at the same time, like I said, we want this higher order information. So to do so, we're going to do something very simple and very direct. We're going to enforce our distance constraints as barriers. And so if you look at this barrier example, this is the simplest one possible here, or one of the simplest, the log. When distances are small, the barrier is going to diverge, and so no intersections are allowed, right? So the nice thing here is this automatically provides arbitrarily large propulsion to avoid interpenetration and reduces our inequality constrained problem to an unconstrained one that supplies the contact forces for us in a Newton type stepper. It also allows line search for stability and convergence with second order information for all of our constraints. So this is nice, and this is a lot of the work that we've done so far, but practically we have some really nasty issues here to still address. And I definitely don't have time to get into all of them, but one of them is probably worth describing here. It's pretty direct and pretty straightforward to explain, is with all the work we've done now, we now have globally valid constraints to evaluate. But in order to keep them valid, we can't throw them away. And for that matter, to make a consistent optimization that works with second order optimization, we also can't throw them away. But now remember that we have constraints for all valid surface primitive pairs, and you can quickly see what kind of trouble we're going to be running into. The number of barriers that we're going to need to evaluate and track is going to grow quadratically as the resolution of the surface meshes increases. And now, no matter how nice our solution method might be, the actual problem we're going to need to solve with optimization numerically and practically speaking, is gonna become intractable even with modest sized meshes. So clearly we'd like to find a way to be able to safely ignore farther away pairs, like some sort of truncation, for instance, like this. And so this is an obvious and tempting solution, again, which is just to simply clamp our barriers at some small distance threshold. And let's call this D hat. But if we do that, we get a C0 continuous objective function, which will absolutely kill practical convergence and make the method not work at all, right? So instead, what we want to do is we're going to construct a simple modifier like this that does three very nice things. So the first nice thing it does is in going to ensure that we can now safely ignore far away constraints. They remain a no op. The second nice thing it's going to do for us is it's going to give us a C2 continuous objective that enables us to build a reliable Newton type solver for IPC. And third, it allows us to controllably improve our geometric accuracy, how close objects will be uh, separated, right? As we decrease our distance threshold, of course, at the cost of becoming more and more compute intensive, right? Because the energy itself becomes sharper and sharper and more strongly nonlinear. So with all these pieces in place, we can now predictably capture real world behaviors by simply plugging in parameters. For instance, in this golf ball experiment here, we just took the report experimental parameters out of the box and we're working quite nicely. And while we can empirically check accuracy in experiments like this, we can also directly confirm it, right? So to do this, let's check some of the optimality conditions of the inequality constraint problem as a starting point. So first thing we have is primal feasibility. And what does primal feasibility tell us? It tells us how well our intersection constraints are being satisfied and when we need it, inversion constraints as well. Of course, I, I don't have time to get into inversion and how that fits into the pipeline, 
Next thing we have is dual feasibility, which essentially corresponds to the intuitive idea, right? That contact forces can push, but not pull. And sometimes we call this a no Velcro condition. Next, we have stationarity. And this measures satisfaction of physics, or if you like, how well our discrete version of Newton's second law in our objective function is actually respect respected. So force balance. And finally, complementarity, which checks that the contact forces are only applied when surfaces are really, really close. So now the nice thing, because of all the work that we've already done is IPC is going to satisfy both primal and dual feasibility by construction, while stationarity and so the physical accuracy of our system is controlled by a user supplied Newton tolerance, which basically tells us how much Newton iterations to actually do. And finally, complementarity and so the geometric accuracy of how close objects can touch is controlled by the user supplied clamping threshold, which is this D hat parameter. So at a high level as advertised, what we're seeing here is that IPC is giving us unconditional feasibility while also supplying separable, controllable, physical and geometric accuracy. So with that in place, we can take a look at a few more examples to get a feel for IPC on top of the other one. So another nice test is to go back to that original chain link experiment that I mentioned earlier. And we continue adding more and more links as we do so over here on the right. As we do that, we start to get to see some of the nice dynamic effects like the shockwave propagation through the chain lengths over here. Friction, of course, is really critical as well. And unfortunately, in 50 minutes, there's just not enough time to go into IPC's friction model, which is another long and interesting story. But you've already been seeing its results in the simulations I've already shown you. And, and with it, we can simulate stable structures, which is always a good stress test, like this precarious masonry arch that you're seeing here. An important thing to notice is it's not a rigid body simulation. We're simulating this with stiff finite element cement materials using neo-hooking elasticity. Here's another great stable structured stress test for friction with a stiff board house. And again, with a stiff neo-hooking material. And again, here, once we hit it, you're seeing the nice transition between sticking and sliding being captured by our model. So finally, here's one last example that I think really ties IPC features together nicely for us. Here, what we're doing is in a minute, we're going to smush these new hooking models through this tight co-dimensional tunnel. All right, so the key thing to watch here is, and to emphasize is that these models are gonna remain non-inverting and non-intersecting all the way through this smooshing process over here until they pop out on the other side. And we're gonna see here that the meshes are gonna remain completely untangled, right? And this is again done at large frame rate size time stepping. Okay. So last couple of minutes, briefly, I wanna to touch on maybe what's next here. And I think the first thing that's next is finding ways for everyone to use this code, right? So proof of the pudding is always in the eating. So one thing to mention is the IPC source code is available online and we have scripts so that you can run out of the box once you've grabbed it and grabbed a couple of few dependencies which come automatically. You can run all the simulations that I've shown you here today. To get you up and started, I've also got a quick, quick start guide and a little hello world examples. So you can quickly grab a config file as simple as this and with our command line interface, you can be up and running with some squishy block examples right away. And then you can start experimenting with a lot more complex examples like the one I've shown you or the ones that you have in mind. And I think playing with codes like this really gives you the best sense of how you might actually be able to use these things. So one important thing to start thinking about is speed. You know? So we started here with this project focusing on accuracy and reliability versus efficiency. The code is quite efficient. I think that you know, when you compare it to existing solvers, it's doing really well for finite elements. Of course, if we start comparing it with PPD methods, we still have a way to go. But I think there's some cool things to start noticing here, right? So one of the things that you're seeing in this experiment is that we're experimenting with really small time steps in the bottom up to incredibly big ones we're stepping essentially at two seconds per time step. And what this means is we can really grab cool sweet spots for when accuracy isn't important using really large time steps. And it also means that if you're using a numerically dissipative integrator, like something like implicit Euler, we can also use this for static solving very quickly at a very large time step to get frictionally contact correct elastostatics using this time stepper. I think there's some cool features that we can do there. And I'm curious to see how people might be able to use this. And finally, you know, what else? I think that, you know, beyond physics, we have this really nice solver here that can satisfy these kind of global injectivity kind of criteria. Uh, so this is one example that we cooked up and I honestly don't know what to do with it, but it is interesting to think about, which is in all the examples so far, objects had started non-intersecting. 
what happens if we nest objects? So here what I've done is I've taken the space alien and the octocat, and I've actually put them inside this volumetric sphere. And now with the same kinds of guarantees and invariants that we had before, they actually stay nested all the way throughout this simulation. So I didn't have time to do a pretty render of it, but I think you get the idea. And again, the question is with the technology that's available, how can we take it and how can we extend it? Another interesting possibility is thinking about how to use this for globally injective parameterization problems, which are very similar in feeling and spirit to what we're doing here. So for projects like these, one thing we're in the process of doing is along with the simulation code, we're actually extracting out the core modules, the core tools for IPC in a toolkit. Um, and so if you wanna play with just the individual components, take a look here and let us know how we might like to put that to use. Okay, so quick summary. What we're seeing here is we're taking steps towards coming up with reliable simulation methods, right? And so key to this is creating controllable and separable accuracy physics and geometry separately, so that depending on requirements, you can spec those in specifically. Key to making this all work again is guaranteed unconditional feasibility. And we want plug and play algorithms like you've seen here. So in this example, no algorithm parameter tweaking or tuning is happening. Of course, parameters do need to be varied, but they should be the ones you as an artist, designer, a simulator want to change in terms of the input scene, uh, boundary conditions and desired accuracy. And so we've confirmed these nice properties across a wide range of material stiffnesses from very soft to super stiff, across really, really large time step sizes up to pretty ridiculous time step sizes, across high speed collisions and extreme deformations. So one other thing to mention, and again, I didn't have time to get into it, because of the work we've done here, the simulation method in IPC is fully differentiable. And so if we go back to some of those applications that I mentioned earlier, in terms of uh, Google training and in terms of design optimization, having gradients available for dynamic optimization, a dynamic simulation, I think is really promising for these things. And I think it'll be exciting to see what we can do with that as well. So plenty more to do here. And with that, I just like to acknowledge the collaborators on the projects that I've just mentioned. And in particular, I'd like to really call out the interns who led these projects and did all the great work that made these things happen. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aries and Danny, for this great talk with amazing slides. Uh, thanks so many. Thanks for so many great questions in the chat. We have a lot of questions. Uh, we will go through, try to go through many of them as much as possible. But sorry in advance for those we won't get to do due to the limited time. So for the Aries, uh, there's a question that uh, would this orthogonal constraint limit some secondary effect that can be achieved, for example, with like scores and stress? Uh, okay, so this is a very good question. I guess, like, I mean, all the methods which has a uh, equality constraints, which means like the searching space of your solution is kind of like limited in some way. There will be like extreme cases that you can't really find like an optimal solution. But as I just mentioned, like our method, like the searching space is only slightly smaller than the full space. So in most, most cases, it just works well. But I agree, like for future work, it will be really interesting to investigate into infinitely robust, like squash scratching handling to couple with our constraint. Great, thank you. Uh, a question for Danny. Uh, are point constraint where posed in continuum elasticity? For the points only example, what if a user, if we use a finer and finer ma for mesh for the simulating one, wouldn't that introduce a little deltas at each point? So sorry, I couldn't quite hear all of the questions. So I think the answer, the, the, sorry, the question might be under refinement of a mesh with collisions with points, are there issues that might yes. come up? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a great question. And I think, you know, the primary issue to think about there is as we refine the mesh, computationally we run into more and more issues, right? Because computationally our stencils grow, even with all the careful work that we've done with respect to the mesh stencils, right? Those are our collision stencils. Okay, got it, thank you. Uh, another question for Aries. Uh, uh, I was wondering uh, what kind of physical priors uh, and laws can be captured? Uh, okay, I think in the examples we demonstrate like our master not only just works on like say those FEM based models and but also something that is simpler like mass spring systems. But I guess in general, as long as you can do like 
the physical simulation, like if you can define the reasonable potential energy and by adding the momentum term, you should be able to, yeah, like, like incorporate our methods. Oh. Got it, thank you. Uh, another question for Danny. Uh, if the time step is too large, uh, can an object fly through another thin object? Because the distance function is positive on both sides of it, or will the line search catch that? Yeah, that that's a super great question that gets to the heart of what we're talking about here, and is is a common failing that we see in all of our codes. And here, the key bit, right, is we're preserving this positivity as an invariant. And so, by preserving it as an invariant, not only at the outer step, but in the inner steps of the optimization we're converging to a solution that never tunnels. So it's tunneling free. And I think the thing that's really exciting, again, is exactly the nice example that the questioner had, which is when we have objects colliding and interacting with co-dimensional surfaces, it, you can't have a magical thickness tolerance. You need to preserve it perfectly. And that's what, you know, what's been really exciting about this formulation is this is the first time I've had a code available where I can do this. So, so the answer is here, there is no tunneling. And we actually, have a cool example in the paper where we really test this thoroughly by colliding with really high speeds at a co-dimensional wall. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question for Aries. Uh, do you think this uh, IPC from Danny can be easily adapted to your system? Um, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure if it's easily, but I think it's definitely possible. Like, as in, as what we showed, like to handle the collision, we use some traditional force-based method, which can be, I mean, not robust, but I think Danny's IPC is like way more robust. And I'm happy to say if it can, like those inequality constraints can work well with our equal, equality constraint together. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question for Danny. Uh, could the rock barrier function cause uh, non-issue sometimes? Sorry, which issues? A non-issue. Oh, none. Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So that's again a, a great question. It's really fun going back and forth between questions between the two projects because there's nice, nice compliments. But for this specific question, I think this is very good. Um, I mentioned there's all kinds of nasty issues, and and here one thing that gets really interesting, and I'll refer you to the paper or bug me afterwards, is Mollification is key here, right? So I showed you one of the mollifications that we did specifically with our barrier. Mollifications also happen, right, at the level of the distance function. And so this is really the difference between making robust work, you know, simulation work in this case and things really not working. So um, I'll point you to the paper or like I said, bug me, but the answer here is that no, it works really well across the board, but only because we're very thoughtful and had to spend a lot of time thinking carefully about how mollification works on distance functions. And for anyone who's worked with collision, maybe not surprisingly, where this really needs to be thoughtful and careful is within edge edge degeneracies in the mesh, right? This is where 3D starts not behaving anything like 2D. Okay. Uh, I guess just one more question for Danny. Uh, does any instability, uh, like, like bifurcation buckling, occur during these extensive contact deformations? Oh, okay. So I, I can interpret this question in two ways. I'll try and interpret both of these ways real quickly for us. So, you know, buckling is fundamentally an instability that you actually want your simulation to capture, right? And as long as our energies, like the deformation energies that we have support such physics, we get that. In fact, we can show examples with that. And so that's quite nice, right? But the, the other way I might interpret this question is when we have these types of non-convex behaviors, they can also make simulation codes really unhappy and the simulation itself can be unstable and explode. Um, for that, we don't have this problem, right? And that is largely because of the time steppers we're using and the strong stability conditions, right? So for instance, if we use implicit Euler, we have strong stability with decay. And so we don't get these instabilities and even under these non-convex conditions, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, and there's a like this could be a general question for both of you. Uh, like who may can answer can answer this. Uh, are there any standards to numerically measure the, how the, our output is close to reality? So for 
like in physical simulation, we usually use like relative uh, comparison with the perception of the real world. So is there any numerical standard measure we could follow? I guess this is a great question for Danny because we saw one of the footage in his presentation. So I think, I think it's a question for both of us because I think there's beautiful lines between you know what's plausible, expressive, and what's real. And I don't know if there's a sharp line. I think it becomes very exciting to think about what people are looking for in different applications in terms of what reality they want. So you go from one end to perceptual metrics to the other end to you know reality metrics. But but if we keep this you know purely on the physics side, this is a, a, a big field in and of itself, develop verification and validation, right? So one of these, right, tells us do I match a mathematical model, right? And this we can do very sharply with our simulations. And I think it's a great thing to do. Um, but of course, mathematical models are only good as they start out with, and as we saw in, in, in some of the things I was pointing out. So validation is much trickier, right? So we need experimental results that we can compare against. And there are benchmarks for doing this, but, but honestly, a lot of the benchmarks, you know, there's not really a good equivalent of a patch test for contact. There have been attempts to do this in the FE literature, but they're not particularly exciting. And so I think you know the thing to do and the thing that we've been trying to do um, you know, in terms of building a benchmark, and I think benchmarks are super, super important here, is to gather these types of examples, right? The golf ball example, I think is super cool with the phone practice ball, because we have a fair amount of data, both visual and uh, in terms of the details about what it has. And, and over time, we'll get more. Um, so I think that's a, a great question. Thank you. Uh, there's a quick, another question from live chat. Like, uh, I think, it, so they asked like, how generic is this simulation library? I think it refers to uh, one Danny introduced. Can it simulate over any mass geometric data structure? Short answer, currently no. Currently we're very specific. We work with tetrahedral meshes, so triangulated meshes. Mm -hmm. okay. I think it's an interesting and very meaningful you know, investigation of the extension. Some meshes will be very straightforward other meshing types, other elements will be more interesting to extend to, but you know, really interesting thing to think about. Great. Uh, yeah, okay, I think I have a last question where it is actually perhaps a little personal question, which is from my really, really shallow experience, I found it really hard to do the research on the physical simulation problem because it was really hard to debug the problem since it has a time axis and compared with the static geometric research. Uh, so what would be a good advice for efficient like simulation research for both of you? Like, Okay, I think personally, I don't have that much experience on simulation yet, but my personal experience is like to debug those just like with uh, like with a uh, deeper understanding of the knowledge itself, you got to design those specific tasks or or experiments to debug your code. You know? Okay. Any okay, I could from say the... something maybe a little contentious for this audience, but I mean, really, when you're doing simulation, you're just running a stack of geometry processing problems in a row with nice warm starting, right? Now, as we saw in Ursa's talk nicely, and I, I talked about a little bit, you know, each of these problems, especially with deformation, but it's true with other ones, are really solving a deformation or distortion optimization type problem that we're all familiar with. And then we're just adding a few regularization terms on top. And if you look at it from that perspective, it, it's, it's not all that different. We're using many of the common tools. And I think there's a lot to be learned by taking geometry tools into physics and vice versa, taking physics tools into geometry. But to kind of get at the core of the question, you know, one great way to get started is don't worry so much about dynamics and time stepping. Just look at a single time step and try and understand deeply what's going right and what's going wrong there. And that's always a great way to start debugging. Okay. All right. Um, I think I think this was a really great talk. Uh, yeah. Thanks everyone for coming to this colloquium. Uh, let's let's thank our speaker again, uh, and then. We want to mention that uh, our great poster from this week is designed by the artist uh, Jerry Stanton. Uh, let's thank him for making such a great poster. Next week, we will be discussing 
hexahedral mesh repair by Joel Marshner, and efficient simulations by Tatian Liu. Um, see you all next week. Thank you.